the Geopolitics and Empire podcast is joined by Patrick Armstrong. He has no relation to our previous guest, Martin Armstrong. Now retired, Patrick was an analyst in the Canadian Department of National Defense, specializing in the Soviet Union and later Russia. He was also a counselor in the Canadian Embassy. These days, he provides extremely insightful and valuable analysis via his website, um, Russia Observer at patrickarmstrong.ca, as well as on strategic culture and elsewhere. We'll be discussing all things Russia, the American Empire, and U.S. Russia relations. And I was thinking perhaps we could start chronologically at the dawn of the unipolar moment in 1990, where the U.S., instead of deciding to be flexible and work with other nations, it went full spectrum dominance on Brzezinski's chessboard with its project for a new American century and attempted to completely uh, eviscerate Russia by backing a Yeltsin coup until I believe Putin stepped into the fray in 1990 to bring Russia back from the brink. So Mr. Armstrong, you know, you, you ha had many years, you, you worked on these issues. And so could you tell us what was your experience and understanding of you know, what happened in the 1990s? I was dumb enough to believe, and frankly, I worked in the Department of National Defense, okay? So you'd think they'd be pretty hostile to the Soviet later to Russia, but they weren't. They were extremely open to the, uh, the notion that the whole thing was changing and that we could talk to the Russians and cooperate with them. Um, I attended our first staff talks, uh, military to military staff talks as the sole civilian on either side of the table. Back in, I can't remember, it's on my website. And we sent quite a delegation, and we were very much open to what they were doing and saying. This is before, I think this would be about 1986, 87. So the Department of National Defense was extremely open to the possibilities, and soldiers are soldiers. When they get together, they, you know, they become soldiers. They talk to each other about a common soldier problem. And I was frequently the only civilian in these meetings. So it's certainly our military in Canada was extremely open to the notion of Russia being a, a cooperative, um, not ally, but friendly country, a normal country. Um, in the Foreign Affairs Department, not so much. We had, a, when we started these staff talks with them, we certainly had some back chat from external affairs. They weren't crazy about the idea. What I was going to say, if you go on my website, you find an essay I wrote, I think about 2010. Anyway, I called it the third turn. And the idea was, boy, was I wrong, that we went through two stages on our dealings with Russia and we're entering a third stage. And the first stage was Russia, the little brother. We're going to teach the Russians how to do business, teach them to be democratic, blah, 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 all this crap. Now, I was dumb enough at the time to think we were doing this, of course. <laughs> Later on, we just learned it was a way of looting Russia um, with a lot of Russian assistance. Then the next stage was Russia the dangerous. It might blow up on us. It wasn't because the Russians were hostile. It was just that things were falling apart. That was the time of red mercury, crazy generals with nuclear weapons and stuff like that. Then I thought around about 2008, that's about 12 years ago, I detected the beginnings, I was obviously wrong, of starting to regard Russia as a normal country. And instead, Russia has become the enemy. It's um, tremendously powerful. I like uh, Brian McDonald's expression, Russophrenia. Russia is a country that's on the edge of collapsing that is nevertheless tremendously powerful. So the whole business became hostile. Now, looking back on it, I think from the get-go, there are a lot of people in Washington who said, we've won, and we're going to put their face in it. We're going to loot them. We're going to break them up. We're going to tear them apart. And they sugarcoated this with all the talk about it, helping and assisting them. But I think there was a genuine element of trying to help and assist, although, you know, basically a, it was, A, a waste of time, B, done by, out of, may have been well-intentioned, but based on ignorance. So it's all been very sad and downhill. And the United States, well, I'm 73 years old. I've lived through the end of the British Empire, the end of the Soviet Empire. And I think if any luck, I'll live through the end of the American Empire. So it's kind of neat. 
How many people have seen three empires go down in their lifetime? The U.S., I think, overextended. It missed the chance. Um, I remember being interviewed for a job at NATO. I don't remember exactly when, let's say 1989-ish, 1990 or something. And I remember saying at the interview that the purpose of NATO was to form an alliance, the good guys, that I include the Soviet Union or Russia, whichever it was at the time, Japan being on the side of order and peace and stuff like that. Well, it certainly didn't happen. Yeah, it was a zero-sum game. It was Brzezinski. It was all that kind of rubbish. It was the neocons. And it's led to disaster for the United States. All those slogans behind you. Liberty, <laughs> not anymore. And we're seeing it today, actually. The chickens have come home to roost. And now the Americans are enjoying a color revolution in their own country. So it's been a disaster all around. However, I do think, I hope, that there's... Enough people in the U.S. military realize that in a war with Russia, they have their head handed to them. Russia is better defended now probably than it's ever been. At yeah, home, up close. Mm -hmm. Before we get into the the collapse, what's happening in America, I wanted to continue along the lines of, of uh, where Russia is in the world today. As you mentioned, you, you, you had this idea of the, the three stages, and you mentioned... Uh, 2008. Uh, before that, I, I believe that Russia had been wanting to integrate with Europe. If I'm not mistaken, um, there's a document from 1955 where I think the Soviets had wanted to become of part of NATO or the European security framework. Uh, and of course, Europe rejected this. And Pu Putin gave a speech, I think, in tw 2008 in Munich, where he basically said Russia had had enough. Uh, and since then, we've yeah. seen all of this reality show, you know, Russia Gate, the r ridiculous Skripal and, and Navalny, Navalny Novichok uh, reality shows, this, the sanctions and this unfair, you know, media propaganda against Russia. And I think recently Lavrov said that, you know, Russia might just stop talking with, with the EU and I, I guess mo move on to focusing on, on Eurasia, this perhaps Eurasian Union and, and the work with uh, China, which some people call the, the dragon bear, right? Dragon China uh, and so on. So uh, where do you see Russia today uh, moving forward? It seems like their economy is, is doing, you know, in a sense, better than uh, other countries and it's, it's relatively stable. Uh, so where do you see Russia today in the world? Well, you know, it's interesting. COVID has obviously hit everybody pretty badly. And I was quite impressed that the IMF has done a prediction of economies in 2020. It has China growing and basically everybody else shrinking. But it has Russia shrinking less than anybody in the G7, which I think is rather interesting, in fact, or anybody in the Eurozone. So Russia, you know, it's always on the edge of collapse. But actually, I think Russia is doing remarkably well. I'm just finishing off a little essay on Russia in the Arctic. It's fantastic what they've done there. You know, this is a country that's on the edge of collapse, doesn't make anything. Um, Canada has five icebreakers, which is more than the other, the second largest number of icebreakers in the Arctic countries. Russia has more than 70, and they've got the world's largest. And they just launched the world's largest and they got more on the stocks and they just started cutting steel for the uh, size even larger than that. Yes, they're planning ahead. China, Russia. Well, you know, I used to sit through all this crap in the uh, 1980s at NATO meetings and the rest of it, talking about common values and all that garbage. What makes an alliance is common enemies. So forget about whether China and Russia have common values, they have common enemies. And it just occurred to me writing this little paper that I'm doing now is once the northern sea route is running with the new uh, leader class icebreakers, I mean, you know, they're five years away probably from going to sea. Then you'll have a route that completely escapes the U.S. Navy. So China can now send stuff to Europe, either on its high speed trains or on container ships to completely avoid the U.S. Navy except for submarines. And submarines are not something I would want to try and interdict anybody with because nobody knows what's happening underwater, if you get what I mean. They, that was the most exciting part of the Cold War is the submarine stuff. So I think Russia and China are looking a long way ahead. And I think 
Furthermore, I think you should probably add Iran to the mix. Again, common enemies. Iran is um, not the same size of power as Russia. And thanks to the neocons, it's even more powerful than it was. Oh, the neocons have been a disaster for the United States. It's been a disaster for everybody. Millions of people killed. The U.S. has destroyed its economy. It's destroyed itself. It's now going to be suffering um, severe civil stress, no matter who's in the White House at the end of January. Uh, Russia and China have outwitted them at every step of the way. Uh, as I say, Russia is militarily probably more powerful in defensive terms than it has ever been. And um, I think even the U.S. generals realize that now. They, U.S. military depends on two assumptions. Complete air superiority and complete solid communications. Okay, the, the Russians have got a lot of air defense, so you can forget the air, total air superiority. The Americans are going to have to fight for air superiority, and they'll only ever have local air superiority. And there's no way they can be sure that they have secure communications. Russia has tremendous electronic warfare capability. So the Russians have looked at what the Americans have to have, and they've countered it. Very smart. Not this. The commies spent all the time trying to beat the Americans and everything. Putin and company, probably around 2008, something like that. Personally, I think it was Libya that made Putin realize that the uh, that there is no possibility of dealing with the West. Maybe it was earlier. I don't know. I wasn't in the Kremlin. There's too much time wasted in trying to figure out what goes on inside the Kremlin. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the days of Kremlinology. And it's been a curse, by the way, of the American CIA. All they ever talked about, we used to have meetings with them, is personalities. It was absurd. If so-and-so gets in, this will happen. If somebody else gets in, that'll happen. It's just rubbish. No wonder they never have any idea what's going on. So, And speaking of personalities, I mean, just, just a quick... Quick take, you know, um, you know, my podcast has been called everything from, you know, I, I'm a Russian agent to extreme left, extreme right, conspiracy theorist, you name it. And just uh, speaking of Putin, you know, I, I've been to Russia myself. I, I've lived in the former Soviet Union, Kazakhstan. I've spoken with real Russian people. And I have the impression that Putin simply is a type of a patriot that has brought Russia back from the dead. Uh, nobody's perfect in any country. Um, some like him, some dislike him. Yet I, I've also heard from Russians that dislike him yet support him because they see no alternative uh, at this point in time as they recognize that Russia is being attacked by outside, uh, including internal destabilizing forces. Uh, and at the very least, Putin is holding things together and bettering the economy and, and the Russia's defense and so on. So, I mean, just uh, your, what's, what's your thought on who Putin is? Well, my favorite polling organization is Levada, formerly known as Vitsion, partly because I knew a guy in Levada way back, but largely because Levada has been doing this, asking the same questions for probably 20, 25 years now. So you got a real historical look at it. And I believe that people support Putin. All the opinion polls suggest that he has a very high level of support, and generally that his team does. And it's a remarkably stable team. You know, there's a few people who have left. Chubayas just got whacked out the other day, but he was not part of Putin's team. You look at the guy I always like is Sergei Shoigu, who's been a minister in the Russian government and has been the number two popular guy in Russia throughout that period. And it's an extraordinarily competent individual. Putin has got a team of competent individuals and basically, they do what you hire a government to do. You know, our rulers are pretty contemptible for the most part. Mediocrities, nincompoops. Putin and Xi, these are guys who are doing what you paid them to do. Simple as that. And as long as Putin keeps doing it, then I think the Russians are going to like it. One of these days, of course, it's He's got to start thinking about his succession. You know, he's got a 
hand off to somebody, and I'm quite confident that he is. Uh, NATO, uh, it seems like for a while things were a bit quiet, but now that you know NATO just it just it seems like it won't stop uh, expanding. It's a, it's obsessed with uh, adding new members. You know, Georgia, uh, I think Montenegro, and it seems like they've renewed their focus on Russia and China. I was just reading yesterday that. Russia's Baltic fleet was uh, reinforced in response to NATO forces build up near Kaliningrad. And then uh, just recently, U.S. declared China as the world's number one threat to democracy. And NATO stated that they must take into account China's emergence as a global military actor, to which China shot back saying, you know, that NATO has this victim complex that drives NATO to view China as a rival. And it's interesting that China says, Outside Europe, NATO could use China's neighbors as leverage to create some trouble or pretext uh, on issues such as the China-India border dispute or South China Sea, uh, possible areas that NATO would want to touch via non-member friends. So, you know, NATO is also expanding into Latin America, where they just recently declared, you know, Colombia as their NATO global partner. Uh, I have a personal belief that, you know, there have been attempts by the U.S. to classify drug cartels as terrorists. And I, I think if they succeeded in doing that, that would give them the pretext for, you know, U.S. intervention or who knows, NATO intervention into Mexico, where I am. So, you know, what's going on with with NATO these days? They just seem to be trying to take over the planet. There's a piece I'm collecting material for, in which I'm not going to call NATO a paper tiger, which I have done in the past. I'm going to call it a paper pussycat. NATO's military power, take away the United States, is a joke. I mean, the German army, which in the Cold War is a fairly formidable force. And you've read enough about it, training with broomsticks and their aircraft won't work and so on. NATO's a farce. It's a joke. This Canadian-led battle group in Latvia, for example, it's just the Russians would just ignore it. If, they, um, if the war ever came, they wouldn't bother with these ridiculous um, multinational battle groups in the, in the Baltic states. The Americans, um, ah, yeah, I love this story. You may remember a couple of years ago, the Americans did this dragon ride. They uh, did some maneuvers in the Baltics and they decided to drive the vehicles through. Um, the new NATO members on the way back to their base in Germany, rather than putting them on trains, which they would normally do. Remember that? No, well, I got I... very excited, Miss Steele. Okay, we're going to show. Um, what is it? We're going to show American firepower to its allies. So what they basically had was the um, I've forgotten what the Americans call them, but they have an eight-wheel um, armored vehicle made in Canada, equipped with heavy machine guns, fifty cal's. Well, anybody who had served in a Warsaw Pact army, which a lot of the audience there driving past would have, would have looked at those things and laughed. You're looking at something that the Sovs had the BTR-80 with a cannon. The Russians today have got this absurd um, um, APC uh, that's based on the their new tank design. They've got standard the um, what the hell do they call it? The Terminator. They got tremendously formidable track vehicles, seriously armored with real guns. And the Americans think with these crappy, lightly armored wheel vehicles with a 50 millimeter or 50 caliber machine gun, you're going to scare anybody? So as soon as they finished this, they said, holy shit, you know, maybe we'd better get some cannons on these things. So finally, after a year or something, they rushed through another got, I think, 25 millimeter cannons on them. Well, whoop de doo I mean, it's it's absurd. They're just looking at themselves in the mirror and thinking they're tough. It's just and the Russians have recreated the guards tank army. That was the moment I did an essay on that. That was the moment that the Russians obviously said, okay, because you know, back I used to know what they had and where they had it. The CFE treaty told us. And they had for years, they had nothing on the Western route, you know, the standard invasion route through Smolensk and on to Moscow. They had nothing there. 
because they weren't worried about the West attacking them, and they weren't intending to attack the West. All their serious stuff at the turn of the century was in the South. Well, now they got the Guards Tank Army. They've decided this is an obviously a major decision. We're going to make a force to defend ourselves. So you added NATO. Well, you know, go ahead and add another half-assed five national battle group somewhere. Until NATO starts putting a core, Americans put a core into Germany, which they had before, which I doubt they'll do, because their troops are all used up somewhere else. No, it's a yeah. paper pussycat. It's a bunch of fools. As Comrade Stalin said, the struggle intensifies. Eh? As you're going down the toilet, you shout louder and you you swim faster. <laughs> Well, to, to take a look at, at, at another one of the tactics, so, you know, you, you've explained to us the, the NATO and its military capability or, or lack thereof. Uh, another one of the strategies that the West has been applying is this more soft power approach, uh, color revolution, uh, regime change. And it seems they're less and less successful, although they've seemed to have stepped this up. Uh, I believe we recently saw a coup attempt in Belarus, possibly Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Moldova just flipped from pro-Russian to pro-EU and even called on Russia to remove its troops from Transnistria, to which Moscow obviously said no. Uh, when I was in Kazakhstan, I personally came across USAID, National Endowment for Democracy, Soros, regime change uh, tactics, which included brainwashing uh, of the youth, some of my actual students who are unwittingly participating in their training, uh, as well as this anti-government protest movement called Wake Up uh, Kazakhstan, uh, where one of the leaders was trained by the National Endowment for Democracy. Moscow just kicked out a Soros-linked uh, U.S. activist, and it seems to be clamping down on foreign NGOs. Uh, but it seems like the, the, you know, the U.S. EU oligarchy just, they won't let it go. Um, do you have any you know, interesting stories in this regard, or what do you make of these perennial attempts to, to squash Russia and its neighbors through these regime change operations. I never know if it's, again, splashing around as you're going down the toilet. Certainly the neocons thought they were on top. And um, I suppose there is some hope that we can carve Russia up and loot it more easily if there's, uh, you know, five or six Russias. Um, so a simple greed. Certainly, the color revolutions were very effective at first, but I think they're stale. I think they're past their stale date now. First of all, the recipients know what to do. By the way, I recommend in this respect you find on a video. I think it's called "Coming Home" or "Returning Home" or something like that. It's about Crimea rejoining Russia. There's a scene in the middle of it. There's a protest of Democrats in Sevastopol, and some guy who's probably was in Kiev as part of the Berkut people is explaining to the cameraman how these things are organized, he said. You see, see all those guys wearing red hats? Watch them. They're the ones who are organizing. They're the directors of the, of the movie. So in other words, they figured this out. And we didn't have a lot of luck on the color revolution of Belarus. I mean, Russia is handling that one. Whatever was ha happening in Karabakh, and I don't know, honestly, I don't know if the Americans are in Karabakh. Um, I don't know who is, but Russia's the one that's, I think they figured out Hong Kong, that were what the China and the rest of them have figured out how to see up. But the point that I would say now, I think color revolutions, they figured out how to stop them. And they figured out what starts them. And they're moving too slowly. Kick them all out. All the NGOs. Everybody should kick out every American NGO. Everybody everywhere in the world. Get them the hell out of here. Because there isn't one of them that's honest. And the ones that were honest have been corrupted. So get them, get them gone. Goodbye. But I think I'm not as worried about color revolutions as I was. The propaganda. Well, you know, that keeps on going. Another factor here, of course, is we just saw a little example of this. Ukraine's not so attractive today, is it? 
I mean, what a miserable shithole of a place Ukraine has become. It wasn't very much to start with. But what a nightmare. Boy, you sure want one of those in Kazakhstan, don't you? <laughs> you know, I've been to Kazakhstan years ago. You know, a place that's burbling along, doing okay, fairly peaceful. I've always admired um, uh, Nazarbayev. He's in the background, still a presence. And uh, boy, we sure want to turn that into a Ukraine, don't we? So I think that the appeal, I call it, and maybe this is another phase. Maybe it's time to write, yeah, probably a, see if I can push this thought. You know what a cargo cult is? I heard that term before, but not quite sure. Okay, allegedly, I don't know if this is really true, but the story behind it is during the Second World War, the United States descended on islands in the middle of the Pacific. I was actually in Bora Bora in February this year. And in January 1942, an enormous convoy of American engineers ships showed up in Bora Bora and built a refueling station. Just like that, zap. So these guys living in these isolated islands, suddenly there was stuff falling out of the sky, all kinds of cool, neat stuff. So in the more isolated areas, apparently they developed a quasi-religion on this. They would build airplanes out of sticks and pray for the cargo to appear again. So for a lot of East Europeans, the whole EU thing in the 90s was a cargo cult. If we join the EU and NATO, we'll be rich, we'll be happy, our cars will get shiny, our teeth will suddenly turn into gold instead of stainless steel, and everything will be just wonderful. Well, didn't work out that way, did it? If you're a prostitute, worked out well. If um, you can get a job as a plumber in the UK, well, that's okay. Um, a lot of these people work as, I do a lot of cruising. A lot of them work on cruise ships. That's fine, nice job. But uh, basically, it hasn't been as much fun as they thought. And that's what we're seeing very interestingly with Hungary and Poland. No, I'm not so sure that I want your total package that you insist that we have now. So I think the cargo cult phase is coming to an end. So the part of the attraction of a color revolution, and you saw it with these wretched Ukrainians, is poof, things will get better. You know, the cargo will fall out of the sky and everybody will be happy and have a good job. Well, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, and, and if you're a prostitute or a stripper, you're okay. Yeah, I mean uh, that's what I told uh, what you said earlier. I, I I had even spoken with Kazakh security, and I told them like, why do you guys allow these NGOs uh, to to operate in Kazakhstan? I mean, on their website, it literally says you know this NGO is sponsored by the usual suspects, and and I, I'm also a Croatian citizen, and I remember when Croatia joined the EU in 2013. It's like as as soon as we joined our like uh, GDP went down 11% or, 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 you know, it just, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't very good. Um, <clears throat> to move on to, to the U S you, you spoke about it before and I'm also American, I'm a U S citizen. And I, I've been seeing this, uh, I've studied history, I, I, how, uh, the historical cycle, how empires, um, rise and fall. Uh, and you know, one of the things uh, as the collapse comes, uh, things that become widespread economic decline, the fracturing of what was once a cohesive uh, national social grouping, extreme political corruption and instability and, and so on. Uh, I've interviewed Dmitry Orlov a, a few times and, you know, he's been expecting yes. the, the American Soviet collapse right. moment. Um, and you've written in some of your articles. And he's that, right. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things that I think Orlov is really right on is for the Soviets, it was a hell of a lot easier. You had an apartment. You weren't homeless. You had some kind of opportunity to get some kind of food at your work, even if nobody paid you. The health system burbled along. It wasn't very good. I mean, hell, I was in Moscow in those days living as a dip. But you could see that there was enough stuff there in the States. There's none of that. It's going to be really desperate in the States. And I hope, hope it doesn't spread too far north, eh? because I live pretty close to the U.S. There's a saying that the Americans... Uh, sneeze and can the canadians catch cold or too far south i'm on the southern border so, <laughs> so. mexico is mexico is not used as a place of um of refuge 
Canada has been a place of refuge for Americans fleeing the United States for 200 and some odd years. Some of my ancestors were um, what we call United Empire loyalists, kicked out of the United States. Oh, I mean, maybe that'll change. Maybe maybe they'll prefer oh, warmer weather uh, like I have, uh, having fled to, to Mexico. Uh, but what do you make of the talk of, uh, you know, the concept, whatever is going to happen with the elections, you know, you've also written that one, regardless, half of the population will not accept uh, the outcome. And there's talk of civil war or the U.S., you know, invoking uh, the, th- uh, you know, foreign enemies to start another foreign uh, adventure. So how do you see 2021 for the United States? It's going to be pretty bad, I think. I mean, if Trump is in the White House, we're going to see, for sure, we're going to see violence. Well, maybe not, maybe not. Antifa and BMD are basically things that are turned on and off by their owners. So maybe their owners will decide if Trump manages to stay in the White House that it's too late that to save their powder. And um, COVID has been... Uh, I think it's going to be pretty bad. How bad? I don't know. I don't think it's going to be um, Bunker Hill and Antietam, but we may be heading in that direction. And for anybody living around them, you want to watch that um, it doesn't blow up and spatter in your face. You mentioned in your uh, an interesting point in your most recent situation report, uh, which people should you know subscribe to. It's a great um, analysis of what's happening uh, regarding yes. Russia. I've done more than 800 of them. Okay, so there's a good backlog. Um, you, you mentioned something interesting that Dmitry Orlov also mentioned to me when I interviewed him regarding the pandemic or, or COVID, that uh, initially the Russians and Chinese uh, may have considered COVID to be a biological warfare uh, attack. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on, on COVID? Do you think it could be a bioweapon, it's a natural pandemic, or, or, or something else? Um, I don't know. Does Orlov think that too? I am, um, all I was doing was trying to figure out why Russia and China built permanent installations. Now, we know China built one permanent hospital. The Russians have built quite a few. As far as I know, nobody else has. So one of our hospitals here is going to build a temporary extension for sort of triaging. Um, some hospital out in um, Calgary, I think, is getting the wants to set, have the military set up a, a tent hospital. But the Russians and the Chinese have built permanent buildings. So my question was, why? So I do not personally know if the Americans use biowarfare in Korea. I've never been convinced one way or the other. But it can be, I think the Chinese think that they did. They certainly said so at the time. So I think at the beginning, now, she and Putin talk a lot. I think at the beginning, there is just that maybe this is what this is. So both of them had pretty hard reactions at the beginning. The Chinese, the hardest. For us and the rest of the world, it was that stupid bunch of studies from Imperial College that made us all shut things down. But I think for the, now, I think it's natural. Um you know, there's been all this stuff about stories about Fort Detrick and the American um, Army team and Wuhan and all this stuff. I, I put all this to one side as insufficient evidence. We don't even know where the damn thing started. Uh, there's evidence, there always has been some evidence that it may have been in Italy or the, even the United States before it turned up in Wuhan. So we don't know where the thing started. I am at the moment quite prepared to believe it is natural. But I just have this theory based on no evidence whatsoever that she and Putin might have thought that it might have been. And then, well, Jesus, you know, because we know that they're thinking about what happens when a superpower goes down. The Soviet Union went down remarkably peacefully. You know, think about it. Maybe 200,000 people killed altogether. Tajikistan, um, Karabakh, places like that, Chechnya, maybe 200,000 killed. That's a very small price to pay for an empire going down. And 
But the U.S., if they go down by starting wars, I mean, God knows they've killed enough people as it is. What happens now if they decide to have a nice little war? Was the Americans aren't very good at war, actually. One of my essays is the Americans do a lot of war, but they're not really very good at it. There was a recent piece uh, where some analysts have said that the chances for nuclear war between the U.S. and Russia have increased uh, due to American sharing of nukes with their European NATO uh, partners. Um, you know, listeners may have noted that although I am, I definitely am anti-war, I just have a feeling that war is inevitable somehow, like the idea of Chekhov's gun, you know, where it says if in act one, you have a pistol hanging on the wall, then it must fire in the last act. And, you know, Putin, for example, recently announced Russia has almost fi finished building a secure nuclear command and control post capable of withstanding a nuclear strike. Um, how real do you feel in the future, the, the, the threat of war between U.S., Russia, and China and Iran, uh, you know, how real are the possibilities, do you feel? Um, the Americans call it kinetic war. Well, these yeah. things can always happen by accident. But I think the Americans are more committed to um, regime change actions, except they don't work so well anymore. It's a race, eh? And the brutal truth is we're in a race. If the U.S. really... I mean, imagine Portland, Oregon, everywhere in the United States, all next year. Well, do you think they're going to have 800, they're going to have their soldiers in 800 bases around the world? They're going to have to come home. Plus, if the country's that divided, so will the military be. So it's a race. How much damage can they do before they have to tend to their own duties? If Trump's in the White House, my guess would be, although he's disappointed me many times, that now he will realize that he really does have to drain the swamp and turn all his attention to that and do it seriously. I mean, if Biden gets in, then it's going to be Obama. Obama benefited the three Bs, bombers or bomb makers, billionaires and bankers. So under Biden, you can expect at least the fourth B, or not Biden under Harris, you can expect the three Bs to do well. But do they want a war? The U.S. military, I think, 20 years ago, probably thought it could beat Russia. You know, anywhere and any time that it wanted to. I don't think they do now, but I don't know. I think... Fortunately, I think in the U.S. military, you lose your you have your brains taken away above the rank of colonel. All, all right. Uh, well, hopefully, well, that's 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 good news, I guess. No, no World War Three. Uh, it was pretty scary during the Cold War. Eh? I was around. I was alive in the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was pretty scary. And I remember because I went to a school near Niagara Falls. It was assumed that Niagara Falls, because it's a big power station, would be hit. So we did the under the desk stuff. Now, I never believed it was going to happen then, but the Cuban Missile Crisis was fairly scary. 1973 Arab Israeli War got a bit nerve wracking. And there were lots and lots of people saying, for sure, some crazy Russian general's going to get a nuke and do something back in the. Uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart. We cruised to that pretty quietly. I guess I'd live on the assumption that nobody would be stupid enough to start a nuclear war because they know what would happen. Yeah. I was amused in this respect to see somebody saying, you know, the Russian Poseidon? I could start a radioactive tidal wave on our cities. Well, no shit, Sherlock. That's what it's designed to do. Think about it. I guess one of my, my, my final questions has to do with one of the reasons uh, you keep writing and I keep uh, podcasting is, you know, your take on this ho horrible media landscape that's filled with just, you know, propaganda and censorship, you know, big tech, the mainstream newspapers are, ju are just junk and, and then, you know, big tech censoring. Um, and so, uh, you know, what's... Um, what can you say on this struggle of writers such as yourself and podcasters such as myself um, as we struggle to set the record straight? Um. 
Well, you know, I'm encouraged. Some guy I've never heard of runs this podcast, gets in touch with me last week and says he's been reading my stuff. Okay, so there's one guy I'd never heard of who's been reading my stuff. And you appeared, you seem to have too. Um, there's other stuff. There's one I'm fond of quoting, refers to me, but it also includes uh, Paul Robinson here in Ottawa. Some guy writing in, some, I refer to it somewhere in my website. And he just can't believe all the stuff he reads about Russia. So he looks around for alternative points of view. And he discovers me, um, the American professor Cohen, and Paul Robinson. So bit by bit, bit by bit. But I'll tell you what I'm convinced of. And I've thought into this a lot because I thought, I don't talk to my neighbors about this anymore. I've learned. You need, first of all, a kind of a religious conversion. When you realize that it's bullshit. Now, Phil Butler wrote a book. He calls it Putin's Praetorians. And a lot of them are people who just couldn't believe the crap they were reading about Sochi. and went looking for something else. So they were converted already when they found people like you and me. So what I hope is the process of conversion is happening out there bit by bit. Um, some of my neighbors, for example, believe COVID is crap. Or, you know, it's a disease there, but the reaction is overreaction. They haven't yet made the, the next step, which is to understand that everything else the mainstream media tells you is a lie. Well, maybe not the sports scores. They haven't made the conversion. Logic schmogic. Yeah. One of, one of my neighbors uh, feels that COVID thing is, you know, the Face masks were bad at the beginning of the year, and now they're necessary and all the rest of it. Logic, she keeps saying, but it's not logical. And I keep saying, it's not logic. You have to make the conversion first. It's, you have to see. Then you can apply logic. But she still believes Trump is an idiot. Um, you know, Ukraine's a paradise. Syria is a terrible dictator. Russia's evil and an enemy, China's blah, blah, blah. She believes all the other crap, but not this, which I find kind of mystifying. She hasn't made the next step. My conclusion is somebody to whom she has given authority told her about COVID. But she hasn't made the connection that, oh, falsus in unum, falsum in omnibus. They're lying to you about one thing. They're probably lying to you about everything else too, except the sports scores. Yeah. <laughs> Check them. <laughs> and, and by the way, yeah, I have interviewed Paul uh, Robinson. Uh, so yeah, he's he's really good. Yes, as I well. know. I looked, I looked up your website. Yeah. I, I saw you had a meeting with Paul. Ah, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and I and Orloff. I mean, the number of the guys you talk to, I either know personally or know about. I have communicated with. I mean, it's a a relatively finite group of people, eh? Yeah, but hopefully, you know, hopefully that grows, uh, as you say, through the conversion. Uh, do you have any final thought for us? Well, tell me how the U.S. election is going to turn out. I think that's going to be rather important. If Trump, if he really realizes that... Um, being president and issuing orders is not enough. You've got to go a lot deeper than that and don't hire your enemies. Then maybe it won't be so bad. If Biden, then we're going to have Obama back again. Hopefully, we're very lucky to have two really smart guys, Putin and Xi, and their teams. You know, really first-class teams that are calm, that are looking ahead, don't get excited, don't get pissed off, don't get riled up. I think Iran is a fairly rational bunch of people too. So I think that's encouraging. In this difficult time, we're not being run by some asshole like um, Pompeius Minimus. Imagine if there was a Russian Pompeius Minimus. I mean, it'd be nuclear, we'd be radioactive ash already. And I think patiently, it's a race between the U.S. imploding and, well, exploding, I guess, either fusion or fission. I think, though, 
I think we're in the last days of the Imperium Americanum. Yeah, in, 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 indeed. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, it's been a good uh, conversation. I hope uh, listeners enjoy it and check out the website, patrickarmstrong.ca and sign up for the, the, I guess you will get updates from the Russian Observer and check out Strategic Culture, which is a good website. Is there any other website or project that we should know about? I don't. No, I'm sorry. I can't really recommend it. Paul Robinson does a good one. Orloff. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, you know, there's a time when I would have rattled off a bunch of websites, but I don't know. I get a lot of my information from Twitter and VK. And that leads me to different places. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way, like aggregating websites, because it's really slim pickings. So. Not, such a, not such a web list. Yeah, interesting. Plus, websites die. Which is why I started my own. So I have a repository for my own stuff. I didn't have to go looking for it. All right. We'll uh, leave it there. Thank you, Patrick Armstrong, for your great analysis uh, that you provide. Uh, and thanks for being on Geopolitics and Empire. Okay, thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast and interview. I would like to remind you that our website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and you can sign up for our mailing list that goes out each weekend with the latest podcast and a long collection of important news headlines. It's good to sign up for the newsletter in case we experience censorship and deplatforming. You can help the Geopolitics and Empire podcast by subscribing to and interacting with all of our channels such as YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Gab, Minds, and Steemit. You can also help us by leaving a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform such as iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, Spreaker, and so on. Finally, if you value our work and our mission and would like to see us continue interviewing experts from across the political spectrum, please consider leaving a one-time donation via PayPal or Bitcoin or becoming a regular monthly supporter on our Patreon. All the links can be found on geopoliticsandempire.com. Thanks for listening.